How far have we come, Dietz? Call asked. Dietz had one amazing skill. He could judge distances traveled better than any man Call had ever known. And he could do it in the daytime, at night, in all weathers, and in brush. It's five miles yet to the out camp, Dietz said. It's a little ways north, too. Let's bear around it, Call said. Augustus considered that an absurd precaution. My God, he said, the Dern camp's five miles away. We can likely slip past it without going clear around by Mexico City. It don't hurt to give it room, Call said. We might scare some more cattle. I've known men who could hear the sound of running cattle a long way off. I couldn't hear Jehovah's trumpet from no five miles off, Augustus said. Anyway, we ain't the only thing in this country that can spook cattle. A lobo wolf can spook them, or a lion. I didn't ask for a speech, Call said. It's foolish to take chances. Some might think it foolish to try and steal horses from the best armed ranch in northern Mexico, Augustus said. Pedro must work about a hundred vaqueros. Yes, but they're spread around, and most of them can't shoot, Call said. Most of us can't either, Augustus said. Dish and Newt ain't never spilt blood, and one of them's drunk anyway. Gus, you'd talk to a possum, Jake said. I wished we had one along, Augustus said. I've seen possums that could outthink this crowd. After that, the talk died, and they all slipped back into the rhythm of the ride. Newt tried hard to stay alert, but their pace was so steady that after a while he stopped thinking and just rode, Dietz in front of him, Dish beside him, P behind. If he had been sleepy, he could almost have gone to sleep at a high trot. It was all so regular. Dish Boggett had ridden off the worst of his drunk, though there were moments when he still felt queasy. Dish had spent most of his life on a horse and could ride in any condition short of paralysis. He had no trouble keeping his place in the group. In time, his head quit throbbing, and he felt well enough to take an interest in the proceedings at hand. He was not troubled by any sense of being lost or any apprehension about Mexican bandits. He was confident of his mount and prepared to outrun any trouble that couldn't be otherwise handled. His main trouble was that he was riding just behind Jake Spoon, and thus was reminded of what had happened in the saloon every time he looked up. He knew he had become a poor second in Lorena's affections to the man just in front of him, and the knowledge rankled. The one consoling thought was that there might be gunplay before the night was over. Dish had never been in a gun battle, but he reasoned that if bullets flew thick and fast, Jake might stop one of them, which could change the whole situation. It wasn't exactly that Dish hoped he'd be killed outright, maybe just wounded enough that they'd have to leave him someplace down river where there might be a doctor. More than once they spotted bunches of longhorn cattle, all of whom ran like deer at the approach of the horsemen. Why, hell, if we was to start to Montana with cattle like these, we'd be there in a week, Augustus said. A horse couldn't keep up with them, nor a steam locomotive, neither. The big camp, Captain, Dietz said, it's over the ridge. We don't want the camp, we want the horse herd, Augustus said in his full voice. Talk up, Gus, Jake said. If you talk a little louder, they'll probably bring the horse herd to us, only they'll be riding it. Well, they're just a bunch of bean-eaters, Augustus said. As long as they don't fart in my direction, I ain't worried. Call turned south. The closer they were to action, the more jocularity bothered him. It seemed to him that men who had been in bad fights and seen death and injury ought to develop a little respect for the dangers of their trade. The last thing he wanted to do at such times was talk. A man who was talking couldn't listen to the country and might miss hearing something that would make the crucial difference. Gus's disregard of common sense in such matters was legendary. Jake appeared to have the same disregard, but Call knew his was mostly bluff. Gus started the joking, and Jake felt like he had to keep up his end of it because he wanted to be thought a cool customer. In fact, though, Gus McRae was a cool customer, perhaps the coolest Call had ever known, and he had known many men who didn't scare easy. His disregard of danger was so complete that Call initially thought he must want to die. He had known men who did want to die, who for some reason had ended up with a dislike of life, and most of them had got the death they wanted. In Texas, in his time, getting killed was easy. But Gus loved to live, and had no intention of letting anyone do him out of any of his pleasures. Call finally decided his coolness was just a byproduct of his general vanity and overconfidence. Call himself spent plenty of time on self-appraisal. He knew what he could certainly do, and what he might do if he was lucky, and what he couldn't do barring a miracle. 
The problem with Gus was that he regarded himself as the miracle in such situations. He treated danger with light contempt or open scorn, and scorn was about all he seemed to have for Pedro Flores, although Pedro had held on to his stony empire through forty violent years. Of course, when trouble came, Gus was reliable, but the only man in the outfit who was really much help as a planner was Dietz. Nobody expected Dietz to talk, which left him free to pay attention, and he paid careful attention, often noticing things that Call had overlooked, or confirming judgments that Call felt uncertain about. Even Gus was quick to admit that Dietz had the best hearing in the outfit, although Dietz himself claimed to rely just as much on his sense of smell, a claim Augustus poked fun at. What does trouble smell like then, he asked. I never noticed it had an odor. You right sure you ain't just smelling yourself? But Dietz would never explain himself or allow Gus to draw him very deeply into argument. How do the coyote know, he sometimes replied. When they had ridden south two or three more miles, Call drew rain. There's another out camp off this way, he said. His wranglers stay in it. I doubt there's more than one or two of them, but we don't want one to get loose to warn the big house. We best sneak in and catch them. Me and Dietz can do it. Them vaqueros are probably drunk by now, Augusta said. Drunk and asleep both. We'll split, Call said. You and Jake and P and Dish go get the horses. We'll catch the wranglers. Only after he said it did he remember the boy. He had forgotten he was along. Of course, it would have been safer for the boy to go after the horse herd, but the order had been given, and he never liked to change his plan once one was struck. Augustus dismounted and tightened his cinch knot. I hope we don't strike too many gullies, he said. I dislike jumping gullies in the dark. Newt's heart gave a little jump when he realized the captain meant to keep him with him. It must mean the captain thought he was worth something after all, though he had no idea how to catch a wrangler, Mexican or otherwise. Once the group split up, Call slowed his pace. He was inwardly annoyed with himself for not sending the boy with Gus. He and Dietz had worked together so long that very little talk was needed between them. Dietz just did what needed to be done silently. But the boy wouldn't know what needed to be done and might blunder into the way. You reckon they keep a dog? Call asked. A dog was likely to bark at anything, and a smart vaquero would heed it and take immediate precautions. Dietz shook his head. A dog would already be barking, he said. Maybe the dog got snake bit. Newt gripped his reins tightly and mashed his hat down on his head every few minutes. He didn't want to lose his hat. Two worries seesawed in his mind, that he might get killed, or that he might make a stupid blunder and displease the captain. Neither was pleasant to contemplate. Call stopped and dismounted when it seemed to him they were about a quarter of a mile from the camp. The boy did the same, but Dietz, for some reason, still sat his horse. Call looked at him and was about to speak, but Dietz lifted his big hand. He apparently heard something they didn't hear. What is it? Call whispered. Dietz got down, still listening. Don't know, he said. Sounded like singing. Why would the vaqueros be singing this time of night? Call asked. Nope, white folks singing, Dietz said. That was even more puzzling. Maybe you hear Gus, Call said. Surely he wouldn't be crazy enough to sing now. I'm going a little closer, Dietz said, handing Newt his reins. Newt felt awkward once Dietz left. He was afraid to speak, so he simply stood holding the two horses. It embarrassed Call that his own hearing had never been as good as it should be. He listened but could hear nothing at all. Then he noticed the boy, who looked tense as a wire. Do you hear it? he asked. At any other time, the question would have struck Newt as simple. Either he heard something or he didn't. But under the press of action and responsibilities, the old certainties dissolved. He did think he heard something, but he couldn't say what. The sound was so distant and indistinct that he couldn't even be sure it was a sound. The harder he strained to hear, the more uncertain he felt about what he heard. He would never have suspected that a simple thing like sound could produce such confusion. I might hear it, Newt said, feeling keenly that the remark was inadequate. It's a real thin sound, he added. Haven't they got birds down here? It could be a bird. Call drew his rifle from his saddle scabbard. Newt started to get his, but Call stopped him. You won't need it, and you might just drop it, he said. I dropped one of mine once and had to go off and leave it. Dietz was suddenly back with them, stepping quietly to the captain's side. They're singing all right, he said. Who? Some white folks, Dietz said. 
two of them. Got him a mule and a donkey. That don't make no sense at all, Carl said. What would two white men be doing in one of Pedro Flores' camps? We can go look, Dietz said. They followed Dietz in single file over a low ridge where they stopped. A flickering light was visible some hundred yards away. When they stopped, Dietz's judgment was immediately borne out. The singing could be plainly heard. The song even sounded familiar. Why, it's Mary McRae, Newt said. Lippy plays it. Call hardly knew what to think. They slipped a little closer to the corner of what had once been a large rail corral. It was obvious that the camp was no longer much used because the corral was in poor repair, rails scattered everywhere. The hut that once belonged to the Wranglers was roofless. Smoke from the singer's fire drifted upward, whiter than the moonlight. This camp's been burnt out, Call whispered. He could hear the singing plainly, which only increased his puzzlement. The voices weren't Mexican, nor were they Texan. They sounded Irish, but why were Irishmen having a singing party in one of Pedro Flores' old cow camps? It was an odd situation to have stumbled onto. He had never heard of an Irish vaquero. The whole business was perplexing, but he couldn't just stand around and wonder about it. The horse herd would soon be on the move. I guess we'd better catch him, he said. We'll just walk in from three sides. If you see one of them make a break for it, try to shoot his horse. No horses, Dietz reminded him, just a mule and a donkey. Shoot it anyway, Call said. What if I hit the man, Newt said. That's his worry, Call said. Not letting him ride away is your worry. They secured their horses to a little stunted tree and turned toward the hut. The singing had stopped, but the voices could still be heard, raised in argument. At that point, the captain and Dietz walked off, leaving Newt alone with his nervousness and a vast weight of responsibility. It occurred to him that he was closest to their own horses. If the men were well-trained bandits, they might like nothing better than to steal three such horses. The singing might be a trick, a way of throwing the captain off guard. Perhaps there were more than two men. The others could be hidden in the darkness. No sooner had it occurred to him that there might be more bandits than he began to wish it hadn't occurred to him. The thought was downright scary. There were lots of low bushes, mostly chaparral, between him and the hut, and there could be a bandit with a boy knife behind any one of them. P. had often explained to him how effective a good boy knife was in the hands of someone who knew where to stick it. Descriptions of stickings came back to his mind as he eased forward. Before he had gone ten steps, he had become almost certain that his end was at hand. It was clear to him that he would be an easy victim for a bandit with the least experience. He had never shot anyone, and he couldn't see well at night. His own helplessness was so obvious to him that he quickly came to feel numb. Not too numb to dread what might happen, but too dull feeling to be able to think of a plan of resistance. He even felt a flash of irritation with the captain for being so careless as to leave him on the side of the house where their horses were. Captain Call's trust, which he had never really expected to earn, had immediately become excessive, leaving him with responsibilities he didn't feel capable of meeting. But time was moving forward, and he himself was walking slowly toward the house, his pistol in one hand. The hut had seemed close when the captain and Dietz were standing with him, but once they left, it had somehow gotten farther away, leaving him many dangerous shadows to negotiate. The one reassuring aspect was that the men in the shadows were talking loudly and probably wouldn't hear him coming unless he lost control completely and shot off his gun. When he got within thirty yards of the house, he stopped and squatted behind a bush. The hut had never been more than a lean-to with a few piles of adobe bricks stacked up around it. Its walls were so broken and full of holes that it was easy to look in. Newt saw that both the men arguing were short and rather stout, also, they were unarmed, or appeared to be. Both had on dirty shirts, and the older of the two men was almost bald. The other one looked young, perhaps no older than himself. They had a bottle, but it evidently didn't have much left in it, because the older one wouldn't pass it to the young one. It was not hard to make out the drift of their conversation, either. The subject of the debate was their next meal. I say we eat the mule, the younger man said. Nothing of the sort, the other said. Then give me a drink, the younger said. Go away, the older man said. You don't deserve my liquor and you won't eat my mule. I'm beholden to this mule and so are you. Didn't it bring you all this way with no complaint? To the desert to die, you mean, the young one said. 
I'm to thank a mule for that. Newt could just make out a thin mule and a small donkey tethered at the entrance of the hut beyond the fire. If it comes to it, we'll eat the donkey, the bald man said. What can you do with a donkey anyway? Train it to sit on its ass and eat sugar cubes, the young one said. Then he giggled at his own wit. Newt edged a little closer, his fear rapidly diminishing. Men who could engage in such conversation didn't seem very dangerous. Just as he was relaxing, a hand suddenly gripped his shoulder, and for a second he nearly fainted with fright, thinking the bowie knife would hit him next. Then he realized it was Dietz. Motioning for him to follow, Dietz walked right up to the hut. He did not appear to be worried in the least. When they were a few feet from the broken adobe wall, Newt saw Captain Call step into the circle of firelight from the other side. You men just hold steady, he said in a calm, almost friendly voice. It evidently didn't sound as friendly to the men around the fire. Murderers, the young one yelled. He sprang to his feet and darted past the captain so fast the captain didn't even have time to trip him or hit him with his rifle barrel. For a fat man, he moved fast, springing on the back of the mule before the other two could even move. Newt expected the captain to shoot him, or at least step over and knock him off the mule, but to his surprise, the captain just stood and watched, his rifle in the crook of his arm. The boy, for he was no older, pounded the mule desperately with his heels, and the mule responded with a short leap, and then went crashing down, throwing the boy over its head and almost back to the spot he had left. Looking more closely, Newt saw why the captain had not bothered to stop the escape. The mule was hobbled. The sight of a man so addled as to try and get away on a hobbled mule was too much for Dietz. He slapped his leg with his big hand and laughed a deep laugh, resting his rifle for a moment on the low adobe wall. You see, it's a poor mule, the boy said indignantly, springing up. Its legs won't work. Dietz laughed even louder. But the bald-headed man sighed and looked at the captain in a rather jolly way. He's my brother, but he ain't smart, he said quietly. The Lord gave him a fine baritone voice, and I guess he thought that was enough to do for a poor Irish boy. I'm smarter than yourself, at least, the boy said, kicking dirt at his brother. He seemed quite prepared to take the quarrel farther, but his brother merely smiled. You must unhobble the mule if you want his legs to work, he said. It's details like that you're always forgetting, Sean. The mule had managed to get to its feet and was standing quietly by the captain. Well, I didn't hobble him, Sean said. I was riding the donkey. The bald-headed man hospitably held the bottle out to the captain. It's only a swallow, he said, but if you're thirsty, you're welcome. Much obliged, but I'll pass, the captain said. Do you men know where you are? We ain't in Ireland, the boy said. I know that much. You wouldn't have a bag of potatoes about you, sir, would you? The older said. We do miss our spuds. Call motioned for Dietz and Newt to join the group. When they did, the bald man stood up. Since you've not bothered to murder us, I'll introduce myself, he said. I'm Alan O'Brien, and this is young Sean. Are those your only animals? Call asked. Just a donkey and a mule? We had three mules to start with, Alan said. I'm afraid our thirst got the better of us. We traded two mules for a donkey and some liquor. And some beans, Sean said. Only the beans were no good. I broke my tooth trying to eat one. It was Call's turn to sigh. He had expected vaqueros, and instead had turned up two helpless Irishmen, neither of whom even had an adequate mount. Both the mule and the donkey looked starved. How'd you men get here, he asked. That would be a long story, Alan said. Are we far from Galveston? That was our destination. You overshot it by a wide mark, Call said. This hut you're resting in belongs to a man named Pedro Flores. He ain't a gentleman, and if he finds you tomorrow, I expect he'll hang you. Oh, he will, Dietz agreed. He'll be mad tomorrow. Fine, we'll go with you, Alan said. He courteously offered the bottle to both Dietz and Newt, and when they refused, drained it with one gulp and flung it into the darkness. Now we're packed, he said. Get the horses, Call said to Newt, looking at the Irishman. They were none of his business, and he could just ride off and leave them, but the theft he was about to commit would put their lives in considerable danger. Pedro Flores would vent his anger on whatever whites lay to hand. I've no time for a long explanation, he said. We've got some horses to the south of here. I'll send a man back with two of them as soon as I can. Be ready. We won't wait for you. You mean leave tonight, the boy said. What about sleep? Just be ready, Call said. 
We'll want to move fast when we move, and you'll never make it on that mule and that jackass. Newt felt sorry for the two. They seemed friendly. The younger one was holding the sack of dried beans. Newt didn't feel he could leave without a word about the beans. You have to soak them beans, he said. Soak them a while, and it softens them up. The captain was already loping away, and Newt didn't dare linger any longer. There's no water to soak them in, Sean said. He was very hungry and inclined to despair at such times. Dietz was the last to leave. Alan O'Brien walked over as he was mounting. I hope you'll not forget us, he said. I do fear we're lost. The captain said, we'll get you. We'll get you, Dietz said. Maybe they'll bring a wagon, Sean said. A wagon would suit me best. A cradle would suit you best, his brother said. They listened as the sound of loping horses grew faint and was lost in the desert night. Chapter 11 Augustus soon found the horse herd in a valley south of the old line camp. Call had predicted its location precisely, but had overestimated its size. A couple of horses whinnied at the sight of riders, but didn't seem particularly disturbed. Probably all Texas horses anyway, Augustus said. Probably had enough of Mexico. I've had enough of it, and I just got here, Jake said, lighting his smoke. I never liked it down here with these chilly bellies. Why, Jake, you should stay and make your home here, Augustus said. That sheriff can't follow you here. Besides, think of the women. I got a woman, Jake said. That one back in Lonesome Dove will do me for a while. She'll do you all right, Augustus said. That girl's got more spunk than you have. What would you know about it, Gus? Jake asked. I don't suppose you've spent time with her, a man your age. The older the violin, the sweeter the music, Augustus said. You never knowed much about women. Jake didn't answer. He had forgotten how much Gus liked argument. I guess you think all women want you to marry them and build them a house and raise five or six brats, Augustus said. But it's my view that very few women are fools, and only a fool would pick you for a chore like that, Jake. You'll do fine for a barn dance or a cakewalk or maybe a picnic, but house building and brat raising ain't exactly your line. Jake kept quiet. He knew that silence was the best defense once Augustus got wound up. It might take him a while to talk himself out, if left alone, but any response would just encourage him. This ain't no hundred horses, he said, after a bit. Maybe we got the wrong herd. Nope, it's right, Augustus said. Pedro just learned not to keep all his remuda in one place. It's almost forty horses here. It won't satisfy Woodrow, but then practically nothing does. He had no sooner spoken than he heard three horses coming from the north. If that ain't them, we're under attack, Jake said. It's them, Augustus said. A scout like you who's traveled in Montana ought to recognize his own men. Gus, you'd exasperate a preacher, Jake said. I don't know what your darn horses sound like. It was an old trick of theirs, trying to make him feel incompetent, as if a man was incompetent because he couldn't see in the dark or identify a local horse by the sound of its trot. I God, you're tetchy, Jake, Augustus said, just as Call rode up. Is this all there is, or did you trot in and run the rest off, he asked. Do them horses look nervous, Augustus asked. Dern, Call said. Last time we was through here, there was two or three hundred horses. Maybe Pedro's going broke, Augustus said. Mexicans can go broke same as Texans. What'd you do with the vaqueros? We didn't find none. We just found two Irishmen. Irishmen, Augustus asked. They just lost, Dietz said. Hell, I can believe they're lost, Jake said. On their way to Galveston, Newt said, thinking it might help clarify the situation. Augustus laughed. I guess it ain't hard to miss Galveston if you start from Ireland, he said. However, it takes skill to miss the darn United States entirely and hit Pedro Flores' ranch. I'd like to meet men who can do that. You'll get your chance, Call said. They don't have mounts, unless you count a mule and a donkey. I guess we better help them out of their fix. I'm surprised they ain't naked, too, Augustus said. I'd have thought some bandit would have stolen their clothes by now. Have you counted these horses, or have you been sitting here jawing, Call said brusquely. The night was turning out to be more complicated and less profitable than he had hoped. I signed that chore to dish Boggett, Augustus said. It's around forty. Not enough, Call said. You take two and go back and get the Irishman. He took his rope off his saddle and handed it to the boy. 
Go catch two horses, he said. You better make hackamores. Newt was so surprised by the assignment he almost dropped the rope. He had never roped a horse in the dark before, but he would have to try. He trotted off toward the horse herd, sure they would probably stampede at the sight of him. But he had a piece of luck. Six or eight horses trotted over to sniff at his mount, and he easily caught one of them. As he was making a second loop and trying to lead the first horse over to pee, Dish Boggett trotted over without being asked and casually roped another horse. What are we going to do, Brandon? he asked. Newt was irritated, for he would have liked to complete the assignment himself, but since it was Dish, he said nothing. Lend them to some men we found, he said. Irishman. Oh, Dish said. I hate to lend my rope to an Irishman. I might be out a good rope. Newt solved that by putting his own rope on the second horse. He led them back to where the captain was waiting. As he did, Mr. Gus began to laugh, causing Newt to worry that he had done something improperly after all. He couldn't imagine what. Then he saw that they were looking at the horse brands, H.I.C. on the left hips. It just goes to show that even sinners can accomplish Christian acts, Augustus said. Here we set out to rob a man, and now we're in a position to return valuable property to a man who's already been robbed. That's curious justice, ain't it? It's a wasted night is what it is, Call said. If it was me, I'd make the man pay a reward for them horses, Jake said. He'd never have seen them again if it hadn't been for us. Call was silent. Of course, they could not charge a man for his own horses. That's all right, Call, Augustus said. We'll make it up off the Irishman. Maybe they got rich uncles, bank directors, or railroad magnates or something. They'll be so happy to see those boys alive again that they'll likely make us partners. Call ignored him, trying to think of some way to salvage the trip. Though he had always been a careful planner, life on the frontier had long ago convinced him of the fragility of plans. The truth was, most plans did fail, to one degree or another, for one reason or another. He had survived as a ranger because he was quick to respond to what he had actually found, not because his planning was infallible. In the present case, he had found two destitute travelers and a herd of recently stolen horses, but it was still four hours till sunup, and he was reluctant to abandon his original position, which was to return with a hundred Mexican horses. It was still possible if he acted decisively. All right, he said quickly sorting over in his head who should be assigned to do what. These are mainly Wilbarge's horses. The reason they're so gentle is because they've been run to a frazzle, and they're used to Texans besides. I'd catch one and ride him home if I could find one that paces, Jake said. I'm about give out from bouncing on this old trotter you boys gave me. Jake's used to feather pillars and Arkansas whores, Augustus said. It's a pity he has to associate with hard old cobs like us. You two can jabber tomorrow, Call said. Pedro's horses have got to be somewhere. I'd like to make a run at them before I quit. That means we have to split three ways. Leave me split the shortest way home, Jake said, never too proud to complain. I've bounced my ass over enough of Mexico. All right, Call said. You and Dietz and Dish take these horses home. He would have liked to have Dietz with him, but Dietz was the only one he knew for certain could take the Will Barger horses on a line for Lonesome Dove. Dish Boggett, though said to be a good hand, was an untested quality, whereas Jake was probably lost himself. Gus, that leaves you the Irishman, he said. If they can ride, you ought to catch up with these horses somewhere this side of the river. Just don't stop to play no poker with them. Augustus considered the situation for a minute. So that's your strategy, is it, he said. You and Newt and P get to have all the fun, and the rest of us are stuck with the chores. Why, I was trying to make it easy for you, Gus, Call said, seeing as you're the oldest and most decrepit. See you for breakfast, then, Augustus said, taking the lead ropes from Newt. I just hope the Irishmen don't expect a buggy. With that, he galloped off. The rest of them trotted down to where P and Dish were sitting, waiting. P, you come with me, Call said, and you, looking at the boy. Though it would expose Newt to more danger, he decided he wanted the boy with him. At least he wouldn't pick up bad habits, as he undoubtedly would have if he had been sent along with Gus. All you three have to do is get these horses to town by sunup, he added. If we ain't back, give Will Barger his. What are you planning to do, stay here and get married? Jake asked. My plans ain't set, he said. Don't you worry about us, just keep them horses moving. He looked at Dietz when he said that. He could not formally make Dietz the leader over two white men, 
but he wanted him to know that he had the responsibility of seeing that the horses got there. Dietz said nothing, but when he trotted off to start the horses, he took the point as if it was his natural place. Dish Boggett loped around to the other point, leaving Jake to bring up the rear. Jake seemed largely uninterested in the proceedings, which was his way. Call your some friend, he said. I ain't been home a whole day, and you already got me stealing horses. But he loped off after the herd and was soon out of sight. P.I. yawned as he watched him go. I swear, he said, Jake's just like he used to be. An hour later, they found the main horse herd in a narrow valley several miles to the north. Call estimated it to be over a hundred horses strong. The situation had its difficulty, the main one being that the horses were barely a mile from the Flores headquarters, and on the wrong side of it at that. It would be necessary to bring them back past the hacienda, or else take them north to the river, a considerably longer route. If Pedro Flores and his men chose to pursue, they would have a fine chance of catching them out in the open in broad daylight, several miles from help. It would be himself and P and the boy against a small army of vaqueros. On the other hand, he didn't relish leaving the horses now that he had found them. He was tempted just to move them right past the hacienda and hope everyone there had gone to bed drunk. Well, we're here, he said. Let's take them. It's a bunch, P said. We won't have to come back for a while. We won't never come back, Carl said. We'll sell some and take the rest with us to Montana. Life was finally starting, Newt thought. Here he was, below the border, about to run off a huge horse herd, and in a few days or weeks he would be going up the trail to a place he had barely even heard of. Most of the cowpokes who went north from Lonesome Dove just went to Kansas and thought that was far, but Montana must be twice as far. He couldn't imagine what such a place would look like. Jake had said it had buffalo and mountains, two things he had never seen, and snow, the hardest thing of all to imagine. He had seen ridges and hills, and so had a notion about mountains, and he had seen pictures of buffalo in the papers that the stage drivers sometimes left Mr. Gus. Snow, however, was an entirely mysterious thing. Once or twice in his lifetime there had been freezes in Lonesome Dove. He had seen thin ice on the water bucket that sat on the porch, but ice wasn't snow, which was supposed to stack up on the ground so high that people had to wade through it. He had seen pictures of people sledding over it, but still couldn't imagine what it would actually feel like to be in snow. I guess we'll just go for home, Carl said. If we wake him up, we wake him up. He looked at the boy. You take the left point, he said. P will be on the right and I'll be behind. If trouble comes, it'll come from behind, and I'll notice it first. If they get after us hot and heavy, we can always drop off thirty or forty horses and hope that satisfies them. They circled the herd and quietly started it moving to the northwest, waving a rope now and then to get the horses in motion, but saying as little as possible. Newt could not help feeling a little odd about it all, since he had somehow had it in his mind that they were coming to Mexico to buy horses, not steal them. It was puzzling that such a muddy little river like the Rio Grande should make such a difference in terms of what was lawful and what not. On the Texas side, horse-stealing was a hanging crime, and many of those hung for it were Mexican cowboys who came across the river to do pretty much what they themselves were doing. The captain was known for his sternness where horse-thieves were concerned, and yet here they were, running off a whole herd. Evidently, if you crossed the river to do it, it stopped being a crime and became a game. Newt didn't really feel that what they were doing was wrong. If it had been wrong, the captain wouldn't have done it. But the thought hit him that under Mexican law, what they were doing might be a hanging offense. It put a different slant on the game. In imagining what it would be like to go to Mexico, he had always supposed the main danger would come in the form of bullets. But he was no longer so sure. On the ride down, he hadn't been worried, because he had a whole company around him. But once they started back, instead of having a whole company around him, he seemed to have no one. P was far across the valley, and the captain was half a mile to the rear. If a bunch of hostile vaqueros sprang up, he might not even be able to find the other two men. Even if he wasn't captured immediately, he could easily get lost. Lonesome Dove might be hard to locate, particularly if he was being chased. If caught, he knew he could expect no mercy. 
The only thing in his favor was that there didn't seem to be any trees around to hang him from. Mr. Gus had once told a story about a horse thief who had to be hung from the rafter of a barn because there were no trees. But so far as Newt could tell, there were no barns in Mexico either. The only thing he knew clearly was that he was scared. He rode for several miles, feeling very apprehensive. The thought of hanging, a new thought, wouldn't leave his mind. It became so powerful at one point that he squeezed his throat with one hand to get a little notion of how it felt not to breathe. It didn't feel so bad when it was just his hand, but he knew a rope would feel a lot worse. But the miles passed and no vaqueros appeared. The horses strung out under the moonlight in a long line, trotting easily. They were well past the hacienda, and the night seemed so peaceful that Newt began to relax a little. After all, the captain and P and the others had done such things many times. It was just a night's work, and one that would soon be over. Newt wasn't tired, and as he became less scared, he began to imagine how gratifying it would be to ride into Lonesome Dove with such a large herd of horses. Everyone who saw them ride in would realize that he was now a man. Even Lorena might see it, if she happened to look out her window at the right time. He and the captain and P were doing an exceptional thing. Dietz would be proud of him, and even Bolivar would take notice. All went peaceful and steady, and the thin moon hung brightly in the west. It seemed to Newt that it must be one of the longest nights of the year. He kept looking to the east, hoping to see a little redness on the horizon, but the horizon was still black. He was thinking about the morning and how nice it would be to cross the river and bring the horses through the town when the peaceful night suddenly went off like a bomb. They were on the long chaparral plain not far south of the river and were easing the horses around a particularly dense thicket of chaparral, prickly pear, and low mesquite when it happened. Newt had dropped off the point a little distance to allow the horses room to skirt the thicket when he heard shots from behind him. Before he had time to look around or even touch his own gun, the horse herd exploded into a dead run and began to spread out. He saw what looked like half the herd charging right at him from the rear. Some of the horses nearest him veered and went crashing into the chaparral. Then he heard P's gun sound from the other side of the thicket and at that point lost all capacity for sorting out what was happening. When the race started, most of the herd was behind him and the horses ahead of him were at least going in the same direction he was. But in a few seconds, once the whole mass of animals was moving at a dead run over the uncertain terrain, he suddenly noticed a stream of animals coming directly toward him from the right. The new bunch had simply cut around the chaparral thicket from the north and collided with the first herd. Before Newt even had time to consider what was happening, he was engulfed in a mass of animals, a few of which went down when the two herds ran together. Then, over the confused neighing of what seemed like hundreds of horses, he began to hear yells and curses, Mexican curses. To his shock, he saw a rider engulfed in the mass like himself, and the rider was not the captain or P.I. He realized then that two horse herds had run together, theirs headed for Texas, the other coming from Texas, both trying to skirt the same thicket, though from opposite directions. The realization was unhelpful, though, because the horses behind him had caught up with him, and all were struggling for running room. For a second he thought of trying to force his way to the outside, but then he saw two riders already there struggling to turn the herd. They were not succeeding, but they were not his riders either, and it struck him that being in the middle of the herd offered a certain safety at least. It quickly became clear that their herd was much the larger, and was forcing the new herd to curve into its flow. Soon all the horses were running northwest, Newt still in the middle of the bunch. Once a big wild-eyed gelding nearly knocked Mouse down. Then Newt heard shots to his left and ducked, thinking the shots were meant for him. Just as he ducked, Mouse leaped a sizable chaparral bush. With his eyes toward the gunfire, Newt was unprepared for the leap and lost a stirrup and one rein, but held onto the saddle horn and kept his seat. From then on, he concentrated on riding, though he still occasionally heard shots. He kept low over his horse, an unnecessary precaution, for the running herd threw up so much dust that he could not have seen ten feet in front of him, even if it had been daylight. He was grateful for the dust. It was choking him, but it was also keeping him from getting shot, a more important consideration. After a few miles, the horses were no longer bunched so tightly. 
It occurred to Newt that he ought to angle out of the herd and not just let himself be carried along like a cow chip on a river, but he didn't know what such a move might mean. Would he be required to shoot at the vaqueros if they were still there? He was almost afraid to take his pistol out of its holster for fear a mouse would jump another bush and he'd drop it. While he was running along, trying not to fall off and hoping he and the horses wouldn't suddenly go over a cut bank or pile into a deep gully of some kind, he heard a sound that was deeply reassuring, the sound of the captain's rifle, the Big Henry. Newt heard it shoot twice. It had to be the captain because he was the only man on the border who carried a Henry. Everyone else had already switched to the lighter Winchesters. The shots meant the captain was all right. They came from ahead, which was odd, since the captain had been behind. But then the vaqueros had been ahead, too. Somehow the captain had managed to get to the front of the run and deal with them. Newt looked back over his shoulder and saw red in the east. It was just a line of red, like somebody had drawn it with a crayon, over the thick black line of the land, but it meant that the night was ending. He didn't know where they were, but they still had a lot of horses. The horses were well spread by then, and he eased out of the herd. Despite the red in the east, the land seemed darker than it had all night. He could see nothing, and just exerted himself to keep up, hoping they were going in the right direction. It felt a little odd to be alive and unharmed after such a deep scare, and Newt kept looking east, wishing the light would hurry so he could see around him and know whether it was safe to relax. For all he knew, Mexicans with Winchesters could be a hundred yards behind him. He wished the captain would shoot again. He had never been in a situation in which he felt so uncertain about everything. Squint as he could, Newt could see nothing but dark land and white dust. Of course, the sun would soon solve the problem. But what would he see when he could see? The captain and P could be ten miles away, and he himself could be riding into Mexico with Pedro Flores's vaqueros. Then, coming over a little rise in the ground, he saw something that gave him heart, a thin silver ribbon to the northwest that could only be the river. The fading moon hung just above it. Across it, Texas was in sight, no less dark than Mexico, but there. The deep relief Newt felt at the sight of it washed away most of his fear. He even recognized the curve of the river. It was the old Comanche crossing, only a mile above Lonesome Dove. Whoever he was with had brought him home. To his dismay, the sight of such a safe, familiar place made him want to cry. It seemed to him that the night had lasted many days, days during which he had been worried every moment that he would do something wrong and make a mistake that meant he would never come back to Lonesome Dove or else come back disgraced. Now it was over, and he was almost back, and relief seemed to run through him like warm water, some of which leaked out his eyes. It made him glad it was still dark, what would the men think if they saw him? There was so much dust on his face that when he quickly wiped away the tears of relief, his fingers rubbed off moist smears of dirt. In a few minutes more, as the herd neared the river, the darkness loosened and began to gray. The red on the eastern horizon was no longer a line, but spread upward like an opened fan. Soon Newt could see the horses moving through the first faint gray light, a lot of horses, then, just as he thought he had brought the flood within himself under control, the darkness loosened its hold yet more, and the first sunlight streamed across the plain, filtering through the cloud of dust to touch the coats of the tired horses, most of whom had slowed to a rapid trot. Ahead, waiting on the bank of the river, was Captain Call, the big Henry in the crook of his arm. The hell bitch was lathered with sweat, but her head was up, and she slung it restlessly as she watched the herd approach, even pointing her keen ears at Mouse for a moment. Neither the captain nor the gray mare looked in the least affected by the long night or the hard ride, yet Newt found himself so moved by the mere sight of them sitting there that he had to brush away yet another tear and smudge his dusty cheek even worse. Down the river a ways he could see P sitting on the rangy bay they called Sardine. Of the hostile vaqueros they had met there was no sign, there were so many questions Newt wanted to ask about what they had done and where they had been that he hardly knew where to begin. Yet when he rode up to the captain, keeping Mouse far enough away from the hell bitch that she wouldn't try to take a bite out of him, 
He didn't ask any questions. They would have poured out of him if it had been Mr. Gus or Dietz or P, but since it was the captain, the questions just stayed inside. All he said at the end of the most exciting and important night of his life was a simple good morning. It's a good one, ain't it? Call said, as he watched the huge herd of horses, well over a hundred of them, pour over the low banks and spread out down the river to drink. P had ridden sardine into the water stirrup deep to keep the herd from spreading too far south. Call knew that it had been rare luck running into the four Mexican horse thieves and getting most of the horses they had just brought over from Texas. The Mexicans had thought they had run into an army. Who but an army would have so many horses, and had not really stayed to make a fight, though he had had to scare off one vaquero who kept trying to turn the herd. As for the boy, it was good that he had picked up a little experience and come through it all with nothing worse than a dirty face. They sat together silently as the top half of the sun shot long ribbons of light across the brown river and the drinking horses, some of whom lay down in the shallows and rolled themselves in the cooling mud. When the herd began to move in twos and threes up the north bank, Call touched the mare, and he and the boy moved out into the water. Call loosened his rein and let the mare drink. He was as pleased with her as he was with the catch. She was sure-footed as a cat, and far from used up, though the boy's mount was so done in, he would be worthless for a week. Pease Big Bay was not much better. Call let the mare drink all she wanted before gathering his rein. Most of the horses had moved to the north bank, and the sun had finished lifting itself clear of the horizon. Let's ease on home, he said to the boy. I hope Will Barger's got his pockets full of money. We've got horses to sell. Chapter 12 If Will Barger was impressed at the sight of so many horses, he gave no sign of it. The small herd had already been penned, and he and Dietz and the man called Chick were quietly separating out horses with the HIC brand on them. Dish Boggett worked the gate between the two corrals, letting Will Barger's horses run through, and waving his rope in the face of those he didn't claim. Jake Spoon was nowhere in sight, nor was there any sign of Augustus and the Irishman. The new herd was far too large to pen. Call had always meant to fence a holding pasture for just such an eventuality, but he had never gotten around to it. In the immediate case, it didn't matter greatly. The horses were tired from their long run and could be left to graze and rest. After breakfast, he would send the boy out to watch them. Will Barger paused from his work a moment, to look at the stream of horses trotting past, then went back to his cutting, which was almost done. Since there was already enough help in the pen, there was nothing for Newt to do but stand by the fence and watch. P had already climbed up on what they called the Opry seat, the top rail of the corral, to watch the proceedings. His bay and Newt's mouse, just unsaddled, took a few steps and then lay down and rolled themselves in the dust. Call was not quite ready to rest the mare. When Will Barger finished his sorting and came over to the fence, it was her, not the captain, that he had his eye on. Good morning, he said. Let's trade. You keep them thirty-eight splendid horses I just sorted out, and I'll take that mean creature you're a straddle of. Thirty-eight for one is generous terms in my book. Keep your book, Call said, not surprised at the offer. P.I. was so startled by what he was hearing that he almost fell off the fence. You mean you'd give up all them horses for the chance of having a hunk bit out of you? He asked. He knew men fancied the captain's mare, but that anyone would fancy her to that extent was almost more than he could credit. Dish Boggett walked over, slapping the dust off his chaps with a coiled rope. Is that your last word on the subject? Will Barger asked. I'm offering thirty-eight for one. You won't get a chance like that every day of your life. Dish snorted. He fancied the gray mare himself. It'd be like trading a fifty-dollar gold piece for thirty-eight nickels, he said. He was in a foul temper anyway. The minute they had the horses penned, Jake Spoon had unsaddled and walked straight to the dry bean, as if that were where he lived. Will Barger ignored him, too. This outfit is full of opinion, he said. If opinions was money, you'd all be rich, he looked at Call. I won't trade this mare, Call said, and that ain't an opinion. No, it's more like a damn hard fact, Will Barger said. I live on a horse, and yet I ain't had but two good ones my whole life. This is my third, Call said. 
Will Barger nodded. Well, sir, he said, I'm obliged to you for getting here on time. It's plain the man you deal with knows where there's a den of thieves. A big den, Call said. Well, let's go, Chick, Will Barger said. We won't get home unless we start. You might as well stay for breakfast, Call said. A couple more of your horses are on their way. What are they doing, traveling on three legs? Will Barger asked. They're with Mr. McCrae, Call said. He travels at his own pace. Talks at it, too, Will Barger said. I don't think we'll wait. Keep them two horses for your trouble. We brought in some nice stock, Call said. You're welcome to look it over if you're still short. Not interested, Will Barger said. You won't rent pigs, and you won't trade that mare, so I might as well be on my way. Then he turned to Dish Boggett. Want a job, son? he asked. You look all right to me. I got a job, Dish said. Running off Mexican horses isn't a job, Will Barger said. It's merely a gamble. You've the look of a cowboy, and I'm about to start up the trail with 3,000 head. So are we, Call said, amused that the man would try to hire a hand out from under him with him sitting there. Going where? Will Barger asked. Going to Montana, Call said. I wouldn't, Will Barger said. He rode over to the gate, leaned over to open it, and rode out, leaving the gate for Chick to close. When Chick tried to lean down and shut the gate, his hat fell off. Nobody walked over to pick it up for him, either. He was forced to dismount, which embarrassed him greatly. Will Barger waited, but he looked impatient. Well, we may see you up the trail, then, he said to Call. I wouldn't aim for Montana, though. Too far, too cold, full of bears, and I don't know about the Indians. They may be beat, but I wouldn't count on it. You might end up making some a present of a fine herd of beef. We'll try not to, Call said. Will Barger rode off, Chick following at the rear of the small horse herd. As Chick rode past, Dish Boggett was greatly tempted to rope him off his horse and box his ears as a means of relieving his feelings about Laurie and Jake Spoon. But the captain was sitting there, so he merely gave Chick a hard stare and let him go. By gosh, I could eat, P.I. said. I sure hope Gus ain't lost. If he's lost, I don't know what we'll do for biscuits, he added, since nobody commented on his remark. You could always get married, Dish observed dryly. There's plenty of women who can make biscuits. It was not the first time P. had had that particular truth pointed out to him. I know there is, he said, but that don't mean there's one of them that would have me. Dietz gave a rich chuckle. Why, the widow Cole would have you, he said. She'd be pleased to have you. Then, well aware that the widow Cole was something of a sore spot with P., he walked off toward the house. Mention of Mary Cole made P.I. very uncomfortable. From time to time throughout his life, it had been pointed out to him that he might marry. Gus McRae was very fond of pointing it out, in fact. But once in a while, even if nobody mentioned one, the thought of women entered his head all on its own. And once it came, it usually tended to stay for several hours, filling his noggin like a cloud of gnats. Of course, a cloud of gnats was nothing in comparison to a cloud of Gulf Coast mosquitoes, so the thought of women was not that bothersome, but it was a thought P. would rather not have in his head. He had never known what to think about women, and still didn't, but so far as actions went, he was content to take his cue from the captain, whose cue was plain. The captain left them strictly alone, and had all the years P. had been with him, excepting only one puzzling instance that had occurred years before, which P. only remembered once every year or two, usually when he was dreaming. He had gone down to the saloon to get an axe someone had borrowed and not returned, and while he was getting the axe, he heard a young woman crying out words and grievances to someone who was with her in her room. The woman doing the crying was the whore named Maggie, Newt's mother, whom Jake Spoon took such a fancy to later. It was only after P. had found the axe and was halfway home with it that it occurred to him that Maggie had been talking to the captain, and had even called him by his first name, which P. had never used in all his years of service. The knowledge that the captain was in the room with a whore struck P. hard, sort of like the bullet that had hit him just behind the shoulder blades in the big Indian scrape up by Fort Phantom Hill. When the bullet hit, he felt a solid whack, and then sort of went numb in the brain. And it was the same with the notion that struck him as he was carrying the axe home from the saloon. Maggie was talking to the captain in the privacy of her room. 
whereas so far as he knew, no one had ever heard of the captain doing more than occasionally tipping his hat to a lady if he met one in the street. Overhearing that snatch of conversation was an accident P was slow to forget. For a month or two after it happened, he went around feeling nervous, expecting life to change in some bold way, and yet nothing changed at all. They all soon went up the river to try and catch some bandits raiding out of Chihuahua, and the captain, so far as he could tell, was the same old captain. By the time they came back, Maggie had had her child, and soon after, Jake Spoon moved in with her for a while. Then he left, and Maggie died, and Gus went down one day and got Newt from the Mexican family that had taken him upon Maggie's death. The years had gone on passing, most of them slow years, particularly after they quit rangering and went into the horse and cattle business. The only real result of overhearing the conversation was that P was cautious from then on about who he let borrow the axe. He liked life slow and didn't want any more mysteries or sharp surprises. Though he was content to stick with the captain and Gus and do his daily work, he found that the problem of women was one that didn't entirely go away. The question of marriage, about which Dietz felt so free to chuckle, was a persistent one. Gus, who had been married twice and who whored whenever he could find a whore, was the main reason it was so persistent. Marriage was one of Gus's favorite subjects. When he got to talking about it, the captain usually took his rifle and went for a walk. But by that time, P would usually be comfortable on the porch and a little sleepy with liquor, so he was the one to get the full benefit of Gus's opinions, one of which was that P was just going to waste by not marrying the widow Cole. The fact that P had only spoken to Mary Cole five or six times in his life, most of them times when she was still married to Josh Cole, didn't mean a thing to a bystander like Gus, or even a bystander like Dietz. Both of them seemed to take it for granted that Mary regarded him as a fit successor to Josh. The thing that seemed to clinch it in their view was that, while Mary was an unusually tall woman, she was not as tall as P. She had been a good foot taller than Josh Cole, a mild fellow who had been in Pickles Gap buying a milk cow when a bad storm hit. A bolt of lightning fried both Josh and his horse. The milk cow had only been singed, but it still affected her milk. Mary Cole never remarried. But in Gus's view, that was only because P.I. had not had the enterprise to walk down the street and ask her. Why, Josh was just a half pint, Gus said frequently. That woman needs a full pint. It'd be a blessing for her to have a man around who could reach the top shelf. P. had never considered that height might be a factor in relations such as marriage. After brooding about it for several months, it occurred to him that Gus was tall, too, and educated as well. Hell, you're tall, he said one night. You ought to marry her yourself. The both of you can read. He knew Mary could read because he had been in church once or twice when the preacher had asked her to read the Psalms. She had a kind of low, scratchy voice, unusual in a woman. Once or twice listening to it made P feel funny, as if someone was tickling the little hairs at the back of the neck. Gus vehemently denied that he would be a suitable mate for Mary Cole. Why, no, P, it wouldn't do, he said. I've done been wrung through the ringer of marriage twice. What a widow wants is someone fresh. It's what all women want, widders or not. If a man's got experience, it's bound to be that he got it with another woman, and that don't never sit well. A forthright woman like Mary probably considers that she can give you all the experience you're ever likely to need. To P, it was all just a troublesome puzzle. He could not remember how the subject had come up in the first place, since he had never said a word about wanting to marry. Whatever else it meant, it meant leaving the captain, and P didn't plan to do that. Of course, Mary didn't live very far away, but the captain always liked to have his men handy in case something came up sudden. There was no knowing what the captain would think if he were to try and marry. One day he pointed out to Gus that he was far from being the only available man in Lonesome Dove. Xavier Vance was available, not to mention Lippy. A number of the traveling men who passed through were surely unmarried, but when he raised the point, Gus just ignored him. Some nights, laying on the porch, he felt a fool for even thinking about such things, and yet think he did. He had lived with men his whole life, rangering and working. During his whole adult life, he couldn't recollect spending ten minutes alone with a woman. He was better acquainted with Gus's pigs than he was with Mary Cole, and more comfortable with them, too. 
The sensible thing would be to ignore Gus and Dietz and think about things that had some bearing on his day's work, like how to keep his old boot from rubbing a corn on his left big toe. An army mule had tromped the toe ten years before, and since then it had stuck out slightly in the wrong direction, just enough to make his boot rub a corn. The only solution to the problem was to cut holes in his boot, which worked fine in dry weather, but had its disadvantages when it was wet and cold. Gus had offered to re-break the toe and set it properly, but P didn't hate the corn that bad. It did seem to him that it was only common sense that a sore toe made more difference in his life than a woman he had barely spoken to, yet his mind didn't see it that way. There were nights when he lay on the porch too sleepy to shave his corn, or even to worry about the problem, when the widow Cole would pop to the surface of his consciousness like a turtle on the surface of a pond. At such times he would pretend to be asleep, for Gus was so sly he could practically read minds, and would surely tease him if he figured out that he was thinking about Mary and her scratchy voice. Even more persistent than the thought of her reading the Psalms was another memory. One day he had been passing her house just as a little thunderstorm swept through the town, scaring the dogs and cats, and rolling tumbleweeds down the middle of the street. Mary had hung a washing and was out in her backyard trying to get it in before the rain struck, but the thunderstorm proved too quick for her. Big drops of rain began to splatter in the dust, and the wind got higher, causing the sheets on Mary's clothesline to flap so hard they popped like guns. P had been raised to be helpful, and since it was obvious that Mary was going to have a hard time with the sheets, he started over to offer his assistance. But the storm had a start on both of them, and before he even got there the rain began to pour down, turning the white dust brown. Most women would have seen at that point that the wash was a lost cause and run for the house, but Mary wasn't running. Her skirt was already so wet it was plastered to her legs, but she was still struggling with one of the flapping sheets. In the struggle, two or three small garments that she had already gathered up blew out of her hand and off across the yard, which had begun to look like a shallow lake. P hurried to retrieve the garments, and then helped Mary get the wet sheet off the line. She was evidently just doing it out of pure stubbornness, since the sun was shining brightly to the west of the storm, and would obviously be available to dry the sheet again in a few minutes. It was P's one close exposure to an aspect of womankind that Gus was always talking about, their penchant for flying directly in the face of reason. Mary was as wet on the top as on the bottom, and the flapping sheet had knocked one of the combs out of her hair, causing it to come loose. The wash was as wet as it had been before she hung it up in the first place, and yet she wasn't quitting. She was taking clothes off the line that would just have to be hung back on in fifteen minutes, and P was helping her do it, as if it all made some sense. While he was steadying the clothesline, he happened to notice something that gave him almost as hard a jolt as the bolt of lightning that killed Josh Cole. The clothes he had rescued were undergarments, white bloomers of the sort that it was obvious Mary was wearing beneath the skirt that was so wet against her legs. P was so shocked that he almost dropped the underpants back in the mud. She was bound to think it bold that he would pick up her undergarments like that, yet she was determined to have the sheets off the line, and all he could do was stand there numb with embarrassment. It was a blessing that rain soon began to pour off his hat brim in streams right in front of his face, making a little waterfall for him to hide behind until the ordeal ended. With the water running off his hat, he only caught blurred glimpses of what was going on. He could not judge to what extent Mary had been shocked by his helpful but thoughtless act. To his surprise, nothing terrible happened. When she finally had the sheet under control, Mary took the bloomers from him as casually as if they were handkerchiefs or table napkins or something. To his vast surprise, she seemed to be rather amused at the sight of him standing there with a stream of water pouring off his hat and falling just in front of his nose. P, it's a good thing you know how to keep your mouth shut, she said. If you opened it right now, you'd probably drown. Many thanks for your help. She was the kind of forthright woman who called men by their first names, and she was known to salt her speech rather freely with criticism. We've the Lord to thank for this bath, she said. I personally didn't need it, but I'm bound to say it might work an improvement where you're concerned. You ain't as bad-looking as I thought, now that you're nearly clean. 
By the time she got to her back porch, the rain was slackening, and the sun was already striking little rainbows through the sparkle of drops that still fell. P had walked on home, the water dripping more slowly from his hat. He never mentioned the incident to anyone, knowing it would mean unmerciful teasing if it ever got out, but he remembered it. When he lay on the porch half drunk and it floated up in his mind, things got mixed into the memory that he hadn't even known he was noticing, such as the smell of Mary's wet flesh. He hadn't meant to smell her, and hadn't made any effort to, and yet the very night after it happened, the first thing he remembered was that Mary had smelled different from any other wet thing he had ever smelled. He could not find a word for what was different about Mary's smell. Maybe it was just that, being a woman, she smelled cleaner than most of the wet creatures he came in contact with. It had been more than a year since the rainstorm, and yet Mary's smell was still part of the memory of it. He also remembered how she seemed to bulge out of her corset at the top and the bottom both. It was not every night that he remembered Mary, though. Much of the time he found himself wondering about the generalities of marriage. The principal aspect he worried over most was that marriage required men and women to live together. He had tried many times to envision how it would be to be alone at night under the same roof with a woman, or to have one there at breakfast and supper. What kind of talk would a woman expect, and what kind of behavior? It stumped him. He couldn't even make a guess. Once in a while it occurred to him that he could tell Mary he would like to marry her, but didn't consider himself worthy to live under the same roof with her. If he put it right, she might take a liberal attitude and allow him to continue to live down the street with the boys, that being what he was used to. He would plan, of course, to make himself available for chores when she required him, otherwise life could go on in its accustomed way. He was even tempted to sound out Gus on the plan. Gus knew more about marriage than anyone else, but every time he planned to bring it up, he either got sleepy first, or decided at the last second he had better keep quiet. If the plan was ridiculous in the eyes of an expert, then P wouldn't know what to think, and besides, Gus would never let up teasing. They were all scattered around the table, finishing one of Ball's greasy breakfasts, when they heard the sound of horses in the yard. The next minute Augustus trotted up and dismounted, with the two Irishmen just a few yards behind him. Instead of being bareback, the Irishmen were riding big silver-studded Mexican saddles and driving eight or ten skinny horses before them. When they reached the porch, they just sat on their horses, looking unhappy. Dish Boggett had not really believed there were any Irishmen down in Mexico, and when he stepped out on the back porch and saw them, he burst right out laughing. Newt felt a little sorry for the two of them, but he had to admit they were a comical sight. The Mexican saddles were all clearly meant for men with longer legs. Their feet did not come anywhere near the stirrups. Even so, the Irishman seemed disinclined to dismount. Augustus jerked the saddle off his tired horse and turned him loose to graze. Get down, boys, he said to the Irishman. You're safe now, as long as you don't eat the cooking. This is what we call home. Alan O'Brien had both hands around the big Mexican saddle horn. He had been holding it so tightly for the last two hours that he was not sure he could turn it loose. He looked down with apprehension. I'd not realized how much taller a horse is than a mule, he said. It seems a long ways down. Dish regarded the remark as the most comical he had ever heard. It had never occurred to him that there could be such a thing as a grown man who didn't know how to dismount from a horse. The sight of the two Irishmen, stuck with their short legs dangling down the sides of the horses, struck him as so funny that he doubled over with laughter. I guess we'll have to build him a ladder, by God, he said, when he could catch his breath. Augustus, too, was mildly amused by the Irishman's ignorance. Why, boys, you just have to flop over and drop, he said. Alan O'Brien accomplished the dismounting with no real trouble. But Sean was reluctant to drop once he flopped over. He hung from the saddle horn for several seconds, which puzzled the horse, so that it began to try and buck a little. It was too thin and too tired to do much, but Sean did get jerked around a little, a sight so funny that even Call laughed. Alan O'Brien, once safe on the ground, immediately joined in the laughter out of relief. Sean finally dropped and stood glaring at his brother. Well, I don't see Jake, 
That figures, Augustus said, taking himself a big dipper of water and squishing a few mouthfuls around and spitting them out to clear the dust from his throat. He then offered the dipper to Alan O'Brien, who imitated the squishing and spitting, thinking it must be a custom of the new country he found himself in. You took your time, I see, Call said. I was about to start back with a burial party. Shucks, Augustus said. Bringing these boys in was such a light task that I went over to Sabina's and stopped off at the whorehouse. Well, that explains the saddles, Call said. Yes, and the horses too, Augustus said. All the bandits was dead drunk by the time we got there. These Irish boys can't maintain much of a pace riding bareback, so we helped ourselves to a few saddles and the best of the nags. Them horses wouldn't make good soap, Tish said, looking at the horses Augustus had brought back. If I wasn't so hungry, I'd argue the point, Augustus said. Bile them horses for a week or two, and they'd produce a fine soap. Young Sean O'Brien could not conceal his disappointment with America. If this is America, where's the snow, he asked, to everyone's surprise. His image of the new country had been strongly influenced by a scene of Boston Harbor in winter that he had seen in an old magazine. There had been lots of snow, and the hot backyard he found himself in was nothing like what he had expected. Instead of ships with tall masts, there was just a low adobe house, with lots of old saddles and pieces of rotting harness piled under a little shed at one corner. Worse still, he could not see a spot of green anywhere. The bushes were gray and thorny, and there were no trees at all. No, son, you've overshot the snow, Augustus said. What we have down here is sand. Call felt his impatience rising. The night had been far more successful than he could have hoped. They could keep the best horses and sell the rest. The profits would easily enable them to hire a crew and outfit a wagon for the trip north. Then all they would have to do would be to gather the cattle and brand them. If everyone would work like they should, it could all be accomplished in three weeks, and they could be on the trail by the first of April, none too soon considering the distance they had to go. The problem would be getting everyone to work like they should. Jake was already off with his whore, and Augustus hadn't had breakfast. You men go eat, Call said to the Irishman. Having rescued them, he could do no less than feed them. Alan O'Brien was looking dejectedly at the few buildings that made up Lonesome Dove. Is this all there is to the town? he asked. Yes, and it's worse than it looks, Augustus said. To the embarrassment of everyone, Sean O'Brien began to cry. It had been an extremely tense night, and he hadn't expected to survive it. All during the ride, he had expected to fall off his horse and to become paralyzed. He associated paralysis with falls because a cousin of his had fallen off a cottage he was thatching and had been paralyzed ever since. The horse Sean had been given seemed to him at least as tall as a cottage, and he felt he had good reason to worry. He had spent a long boat ride growing more and more homesick for the green land he had left, when they were put ashore at Veracruz, he had not been too disappointed. It was only Mexico they were in, and no one had ever told him Mexico was green. But now they were in America, and all he could see was dust and low bushes with thorns, and almost no grass at all. He had expected coolness and dew, and green grass on which to stretch out for a long nap. The bare hot yard was a cruel letdown, and besides, Sean was an easy weeper, Tears ran out of his eyes whenever he thought of anything sad. His brother Alan was so embarrassed by the sight of Sean's tears that he walked straight into the house and sat down at the table. They had been asked to eat. If Sean preferred to stand in the yard crying, that was his problem. Dish concluded that the young Irishman was probably crazy. Only someone crazy would break out crying in front of several grown men. Augustus saved the day by going over and taking Sean by the arm. He spoke kindly to him and led him toward the house. Let's go eat, son, he said. It won't look quite so ugly on a full stomach. But where's the grass? Sean asked, snuffling. Dish Boggett let out a whoop. I guess he was meaning to graze, he said. Why no, Dish, Augusta said. He was just reared in a place where the grass covers the ground, not in no desert like you. I was reared on the Matagorda, Dish said. We got grass knee-high over there. Gus, we need to talk a minute, Call said. But Augustus had already led the boy through the door, and Call had to follow him in. A surprised Bolivar watched the Irishmen put away sowbelly and beans. He was so startled by their appearance that he picked up a shotgun that he kept by the cook stove and put it across his lap. 
It was his goat gun, a rusty ten-gauge, and he liked to have it handy if anything unusual happened. I hope you don't decide to shoot that thing off in here, Augustus said. It'd take a wall out if you did, not to mention us. I don't shoot yet, Ball said sullenly, keeping his options open. Carl waited until Augustus filled his plate, since there would be no getting his attention until he had food before him. The young Irish boy had stopped crying and was putting away beans faster even than Augustus. Starvation was probably all that was wrong with him. I'm going to go see if I can hire some hands, Call said. You better move them horses this afternoon. Move them where? Augustus asked. Up river, as far as you want, Call said. These Irishmen have fine voices, Augustus remarked. It's a pity there ain't two more of them. We'd have a barbershop quartet. It would be a pity if you lost them horses while I'm off hiring the hands, too, Call pointed out. Oh, you mean you want me to sleep out on the ground for several nights just to keep Pedro from stealing these horses back, Cus asked. I'm out of practice sleeping on the ground. What was you planning to sleep on on the way to Montana, Call asked in turn. We can't take the house with us, and there ain't many hotels between here and there. I hadn't been planning on going to Montana, Augusta said. That's your plan. I may come if I feel like it, or you may change your mind. I know you never have changed your mind about anything yet, but there's a first time for everything. You'd argue with a stump, Call said. Just watch them horses. We may never get that lucky again. Call saw there was no point in losing any more time. If Augustus was not of a mind to be serious, nothing could move him. Jake did come back, didn't he? Augustus asked. His horse is here, Call said. I guess he probably come with it. Do you think he'll work once we start? No, and I won't either, Augustus said. You better hire these Irish boys while you got the chance. It's work we're looking for, Alan said. What we don't know we'll gladly learn. Call refrained from comment. Men who didn't know how to get on and off a horse would not be much use around a cow outfit. Where are you going hiring? Augustus asked. I might go to the Rainies, Call said. As many boys as they got, they ought to be able to spare a few. I sparked Maud Rainey once upon a time. Augustus said, tilting back his chair. If we hadn't had the Comanches to worry with, I expect I'd have married her. Her name was Grove before she married. She lays them boys like hens lay eggs, don't she? Call left to keep from having to talk all day. Dietz was catching a short nap on the back porch, but he sat up when Call came out. Dish Boggett and the boy were roping low bushes, Dish teaching the boy a thing or two about the craft of roping, that was good, since nobody around the Hat Creek outfit could rope well enough to teach him anything. Call himself could rope in an emergency, and so could Pee, but neither of them were ropers of the first class. Practice up, boys, he said. As soon as we gather some cattle, there's going to be a pile of roping to do. Then he caught his second best horse, a sorrel gelding they called Sunup, and headed northeast toward the brush country. Chapter 13 Lorena had stopped expecting ever to be surprised, least of all by a man, and then Jake Spoon walked in the door and surprised her. The surprise started the minute before he even spoke to her. Partly it was that he seemed to know her the minute he saw her. She had been sitting at a table, expecting Dish Boggett to come back with another two dollars he had borrowed somewhere. It was an expectation that brought her no pleasure. It was clear Dish expected something altogether different from what the two dollars would buy him. That was why, in general, she preferred older men to young ones. The older ones were more likely to be content with what they paid for. The young ones almost always got in love with her and expected it to make a difference. It got so she never said a word to the young men, thinking that the less she said, the less they would expect. Of course, they went right on expecting, but at least it saved her having to talk. She could tell Dish Boggett was going to pester her as long as he could afford to, and when she heard boot heels and the jingle of spurs on the porch, she assumed it was him coming back for a second round. Instead, Jake had walked in. Lippy gave a whoop, and Xavier was excited enough that he came out from behind the bar and shook Jake's hand. Jake was polite and glad to see them and took the trouble to ask their health and make a few jokes. But even before he had drunk the free drink Xavier offered him, he had begun to make a difference in the way she felt. He had big muddy brown eyes and a neat mustache that turned down at the corners. 
but of course she had seen big eyes and mustaches before. What made the difference was that Jake was so at home and relaxed, even after he saw her sitting there. Most men got nervous when they saw her, aware that their wives wouldn't like them being in the same room with her, or else made nervous by the thought of what they wanted from her, which they couldn't get without some awkward formalities of a sort that few of them could handle smoothly. But Jake was the opposite of nervous. Before he even spoke to her, he smiled at her several times in the most relaxed way, not in the bragging way Tinkersley had when he smiled. Tinkersley's smile had said plainly enough that he felt she ought to be grateful for the chance to do whatever he wanted her to do. Of course, she was grateful to him for taking her away from Mosby and the smoke pots. But once she had been away for a while, she came to hate Tinkersley's smile. Lorena felt puzzled for a moment. She didn't ignore the men who walked through the door of the dry bean. 